when he said that he had guns and was wondering if we were going to send ATF after him, he seemed a little upset. Good afternoon, Judge. This is the State of Nevada versus Roger Hillegas and Stuart Hanty, case number RCR 2019 A and B. Counsel, please state your name for the record. I'm Zima Stegi. I represent the State of Nevada. Steve Evenson on behalf of, of Mr. Hillegas. Tom Pitaro and uh, Mr. Hillegas is also on. Mr. Hanty, do you mean? What did I say? Oh. Mr. Handy is what I mean. Whatever I said, I meant Dante. Okay. And Roger see, is present as well, Judge. <laughs> yes, I do see that Mr. Hilligus is present. I see Mr. Handy is present. And I will just put on the record that we also have this streaming live on YouTube. So anyone who wishes to watch the proceedings on YouTube can go to YouTube, search Reno Justice Court, and then click on Courtroom D. And that is where a live stream of this is available to the public to view. So council today was set for a couple things. The first matter is regarding the preliminary hearing. The preliminary hearing is currently set for March 23rd at 9 a.m. And I am pleased to say that the COVID levels in Washoe County have dropped such that the court is now available to conduct certain hearings, such as preliminary hearings in person. I believe it was the party's request previously that, that I had said we discussed today to hold the preliminary hearing in person. I don't see why we can't do that. I think in person would be fine. Uh, we just need to talk about some logistical things regarding accomplishing that. And one of them is that while we can be in person for the preliminary hearing, all parties and witnesses will have to wear masks at all times. I want everyone to know that. And as far as spectators in the courtroom, we have to limit spectators in the courtroom due to COVID concerns and physical distancing concerns. We will also stream this live on our YouTube channel, the preliminary hearing. So the public again is free to watch through YouTube live, but as to in person, and I'll certainly let counsel be heard on this, but what uh, I was considering, and this is what we've done in other cases is allowing um, each party, essentially the state and the defendants to have eight spectators. So, uh, essentially um, eight spectators for the prosecution, eight spectators for the defense. And what they would need to do is counsel would need to submit their names to the clerk so that when they arrive to watch the proceedings, the bailiff can verify uh, that we have the correct folks there who counsel indicated would like to watch the proceedings in person due to the social distancing limits. And then everyone else is welcome to watch via the YouTube feed, which is live. So let me, I will turn to um, Mr. Stegi and then I'll return to Mr. Evenson and Mr. Pataro as well. Your thoughts, Mr. Stegi? I think that's uh, fine, uh, Your Honor, uh, on that sort of narrow subject of, of in-person. Uh, I do have, uh, I learned uh, earlier this week, I think it was, that one of my witnesses has relocated very much uh, out of state. So I would be seeking the um, court's permission to uh, allow uh, that singular witness uh, being Miss Lyons uh, to appear via Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, I have on a related uh, matter. Uh, I did not realize, Your Honor, that this uh, was scheduled during spring break. So I have uh, two witnesses that um, I would be uh, in all likelihood asking the court to bifurcate. So I, I would like to forge ahead uh, on the date set, uh, but it may necessitate that we uh, come back for a witness or two based on uh, officers uh, pre made plans on spring break. All right, thank you for letting the court know. Uh, Mr. Evenson, I'll turn to you and then I'll turn to Mr. Pataro on that issue. Your Honor, I'm on uh, spring break with my kids right now, so I'm hardly in a position to complain about uh, somebody having spring break issues. However, uh, with a preliminary hearing of this nature and with the issues involved and people involved, I'd much rather not bif bifurcate it 
uh, if we don't have to. Uh, I know this thing has been kicking around for a long time, uh, and I will leave it to your discretion as to how to handle that, but I think bifurcating it actually makes it more difficult on the witnesses. I think it makes it more difficult on Mr. Pitaro and uh, his client, and I would prefer uh, to do it all in one day in one location at the same time, even if we have to set that up down the road rather than bifurcating it. <clears throat> because I know Mr. Pitaro is busy as am I. Um, obviously you've got a calendar as well and so does the state. And so I'm not sure if we'd be coming back three days later or three months later. And I think that that sometimes leads to its own issues. So uh, if Mr. Stegi is saying that he has those kind of issues, I don't have a problem continuing it so we can do it all in one day. I have no idea what Mr. Pitaro is going to say, but that's my thoughts on those issues. And, and I agree with you 150,000% that the uh, in-person is an absolute necessity in this case. I think it'd be a, a really uh, interesting process to try and do this case via Zoom. So um, we just have to figure out when. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Pitaro, your thoughts? Yes, Your Honor. Um, uh, first, as far as the idea of uh, witnesses uh, in the courtroom, I mean, spectators in the courtroom. I assume when you say eight for the state, you meant eight for the defense. So we would have to divide that up. That's that's fine. I don't think that is going to be a problem. I, 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 I do have a real concern with bifurcating this um, with, with, all, with all due respect to uh, the, the way things have been going. Um, I'm going to have to fly up there uh, for this, for the Tuesday date, a few days in advance, and then having to come back uh, uh, really is, is an imposition. I will tell you, I will change every, if, if we just put it to a date, like, like we uh, thought we were doing at the time. Uh, and I, all, all, my, all, my, all my kids are, have their own kids. I don't have to worry about spring break, but, um, I can make arrangements for any date that you would say if we just have it in one day. So if you say you want it in a week, whenever spring break is over, or two weeks or three weeks, then, then that's it. I don't have any trials uh, set down here in Las Vegas uh, because of the COVID and the in custody is going first. And uh, the way it is, I, I, I don't anticipate being on a trial, uh, uh, even for my in custody murder cases until. Uh, midsummer, so uh, I would appreciate it uh, as, as a convenience to me. Uh, and uh, whatever date you want, I'll make my, myself available. Uh, I, I would be able to do that, Your Honor. All right. Well, as um, Council knows, this case has been pending for quite some time. I think the majority of that has been due to COVID and the desire of Council to try and hold in-person preliminary hearing. We have been holding Zoom hearings in the past. We have throughout the pandemic, but it was my understanding that council would prefer in person. So the court's been trying to accommodate that. And now I think we can accommodate that. So Mr. Stegi, it sounds like both council for the defense would like to do it in one day. Um, I'm willing to look for a day on the calendar. I would be, um, I, I'm of the same mind that I would like to, to hear the case sooner as opposed to later. It, it's, it's been a while. Your thoughts on finding an alternate date if your witnesses aren't available on the 23rd? But well, I think I heard uh, somewhere between the lines from uh, both the STEAM Council, uh, the agreement that the uh, witness who's moved to uh, Alaska could appear by Zoom and so if I correctly uh, heard that, then I would be willing to look for uh, a new date. I don't think either of them, frankly, uh, weighed in on that. But um, I certainly understand the court's uh, concerns, and I have the same concern. The, the length that this case has been pending is rather uh, difficult uh, to deal with. So, Mr. Stegi, just to be clear, you're indicating that as long as Ms. Lyons can appear by Zoom, you believe you can have all your other witnesses ready to go on the 23rd as planned? No, no. Ms. Lyons, standalone, uh, has moved to Alaska. And so I would ask, independent of whatever date, that she appear by Zoom. I think that's contemplated by okay. the, C the Supreme Court rules. Um, yes, I, I don't have any objection to that. And I'll, Mr. Evanson or Mr. Pataro... Any objection to having that one witness appear by Zoom? Your Honor, from my perspective, obviously I would not want any witnesses by Zoom, but it's my understanding of the law, irrespective of 
uh, uh, COVID uh, that when a witness is so many miles outside of the jurisdiction uh, that the court has the discretion to do that. I, I, I don't see that as a COVID issue. I see that more as a, 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 just the basic uh, uh, standard that the court has discretion to do. I mean, obviously I don't like uh, uh, that type of procedure, but I'm, I'm not gonna argue it on based upon uh, a COVID. I think it goes back to the uh, statutes as written now based upon witnesses who are so far, so far out of state that uh, it's the only way to do it. Is do it either that or by, uh, or by deposition and I don't feel like going to Alaska. Mr. Evanson, sir, your uh, feelings about having the one witness who's currently in Alaska appearing by Zoom. You had it right the first time, Your Honor. First time you said it was Evanson and you did good. Now you're back to Evanson. Oh, you know. I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. I think in Norway it's Evanson, but only my family could figure out a way to mispronounce their own name. Um, I'm, I agree with Mr. Pitaro's comments. Uh, it is uh, correct that I would prefer not to have any witnesses appear by Zoom, but I think the status law that he states is correct. And, and uh, uh, if Mr. Stege is saying, as long as we're doing that, we should all try to do it all in one day later, that sounds like a fine, fair resolution to me. All right, so Mr. Stege, I, I believe that the law permits for a witness who's out of state to testify via Zoom. So I will allow that in the case of Ms. Lyons. So that's settled. Now, as far as the date, Mr. Stege. Uh, as to these two witnesses, the first available would be the 30th uh, of March. Uh, the difficulty, with, that's a difficult time uh, for me, Your Honor, given, uh, I know the court's aware of the trial flights uh, in district court. I have a uh, two defendant murder case on the April flight. I'm not, um, Real confident about its chances, but uh, it's not going to deter my uh, preparation. Um, I will know the answer to that uh, at the motion to confirm, uh, which is on the uh, 17th of March. So perhaps, and, and so assuming my April flight uh, trial flight goes off, I'd be available rather quickly. Um, so. If it's all right with the court, I would ask that perhaps we status this case next week, the 18th. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Evenson, Mr. Patara, myself can uh, have an email conversation about uh, potential dates that work. And I will say, it, historically, the court has worked well uh, on Friday for lengthy prelims. And so um, that's what I'd be shooting for. Counsel, so it sounds like there's a suggestion for uh, Mr. Evenson, Mr. Pataro, and Mr. Stege to get together and to reset this with the clerk for a full day, perhaps a Friday. Any objection to that? Not for me, Your Honor. I think a Friday is a good idea. I try to keep those fairly open, so that would be uh, a, a good time to look at some dates down the road. I don't know what Mr. Pataro's thoughts are, but that would certainly work for me. As, as long as uh, the airlines flies to Reno from Las Vegas, I'll be here. I think they are. So I, I think, think we should be all I mean, right. Three months ago, I could have got a ticket for nothing. They would have paid me for the ticket. Now, now we have to pay again. That's right. All right. So let's do this. It sounds like the, the 23rd will not work due to uh, Mr. Stegi's witness unavailability. And the parties have agreed that they are going to get together reach out to the clerk to see if we can specially set this on a Friday. I'm willing to be uh, very accommodating. Um, I, I understand everyone would like to see this move more quickly as, a, as opposed to more slowly. So we'll have the parties get together with the clerk to look for some dates outside of this hearing. And then before we move to the uh, motions filed by Mr. Stege and the opposition filed by Mr. Pataro about Mr. Handchi, is there anything else we need to discuss as far as logistics or housekeeping? Yeah, could I, I just inquire, uh, the, the clerk then will be able to schedule your, your matters for uh, whatever date it is. So should be the one in charge of that. We will not have to go back to the court. Correct. You can work with the clerk to do that. And obviously she will be reaching out to me just to make sure that I don't have any other conflicts with the date. But yes, you can work with the clerk to do that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Anything else, um, Council General Housekeeping? 
as a as a general matter, Your Honor, we had uh, a series of uh, emails that uh, I believe one or the other defendant um, has forwarded this Zoom link to uh, 400 people. Uh, we were delayed this afternoon in uh, the clerk having to find uh, witnesses in the uh, gallery uh, and the, uh, one of the defendants as well. So perhaps an admonition from the court uh, that the Zoom link ought to be, because this is available on YouTube, ought not to be uh, shared um, except to witnesses and parties. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand that, Your Honor. So I think, Mr. Mr. Patar, I think the issue is that there, um, the, the clerk had received numerous people wanting to join through the Zoom link who are not parties and not attorneys and not in media that have properly made a written request in advance. Okay. And the, the problem with that is when there are so many folks lined up on the link, the clerk has to try and scroll through all of them to find the appropriate parties. For instance, yourself, um, Mr. Evenson, Mr. Hanty, Mr. Hilligus, through many names. Also, we, we simply cannot have that many people participating on the Zoom link from prior experience in Zoom. The, the more people that are on, people forget to mute themselves. We can hear background noise. Uh, the sound quality is not good when there's background noise. And frankly, the, the way that the court has set up for folks to view these hearings live is not through the Zoom link, it's through YouTube. As you can see, if you look in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a little red button that says live on YouTube. And that means that our proceedings are being transmitted live on YouTube for all who would wish to watch them. So that, that is the way that spectators should watch the Zoom proceedings. And that is the way that the spectators will be able to watch the actual preliminary hearing if they're not on the list of those who are going to be permitted to be in person. And again, this is, is due to COVID. So I, I agree that, that the Zoom link is reserved for parties and counsel and media who have made the appropriate media requests and writing. All other interested people are more than welcome and they're invited to watch live on YouTube. Hey, thank you. I, I just didn't hear Mr. Fagan. No problem. Clearly, so I wasn't sure what he was saying. No problem. I think that was it. Any questions about that, Mr. Evenson? Not for me, Your Honor, no. Okay. Um, anything else, counsel, for housekeeping? No, Your Honor, from uh, Ms. Dianti. All Let right. Okay. So now um, there is there was a motion in an opposition file that only relates to Mr. Hanty. Mr. Evenson, you and your client, you certainly don't need to be present for this. If you'd like to be, you'd certainly you're invited to remain, but you don't need to be at this point. We're only going to be discussing the motion that's related particularly to Mr. Hanty. Your Honor, anytime I can watch two counsel like Mr. Stegan, Mr. Patero uh, going toe to toe, I'll take that opportunity to sit ringside. Thank you. All right. So the motion, I've, I've read the motion in the opposition. The motion was filed by Mr. Stakey. So I'll allow him to go first and summarize his motion and what he would like me to hear about the issue. Uh, Your Honor, uh, in summary, um, the state did not get uh, an opportunity to argue for bail. Uh, in this case, this was uh, uh, because of the age of the case. Uh, this uh, happened some time ago. But the defendant was OR'd. Um, now, subsequent to that, uh, the state has learned uh, two pieces of information that are uh, caused the state concern, and I think the court as well, uh, as to the, the defendant being a risk uh, to the community. Uh, the first piece is summarized uh, in uh, my exhibit, and uh, that being statements made by uh, Mr. Hanty. Uh, and of concern to the state, and I think to any court, is a uh, defendant making uh, statements that a person will pay while inside of a uh, gun store. Uh, and the second part of that that would ought to cause a court concern about uh, the defendant's risk is anytime a particular person's name is, uh, affiliated with the prosecution or uh, law enforcement involved in the case, or a particular name is used that that ought to raise the court's 
uh, sort of concern for the defendant's mental uh, state uh, and risk uh, to the community. And now what I'm referring to, of course, is uh, an, a bail factor under NRS 1784853, sub four talked about reputation, character, and the mental condition of the defendant. Uh, the second piece of information is outlined in my uh, motion, uh, and that being a more recent and subsequent act uh, and or statements of the uh, defendant, that being uh, his disregard for uh, the law. Now, uh, it is well known that Mr. Hanty is a, uh, was a uh, state trooper and various other lesser uh, law enforcement uh, sort of roles uh, subsequent to his dismissal from the department. And uh, what we learn from the second act is the defendant's uh, disregard for the law. That being uh, his statement to, and I am prepared with testimony this afternoon, his statement to, um, now he goes in and, and tries to do a gun transfer again. I'm, I'm not concerned, I'm not going to argue today whether he had the federal right or not to do that. But his reaction to when the state uh, official denied that trans that transfer uh, is illuminating uh, to the defendant's mental state and to his risk to the community. Um, that being his statement that he would, if, if uh, the transfer continued to be denied, he would simply have his wife uh, conduct the transfer. Uh, that show the disregard for the law. It also uh, hints at a uh, serious uh, federal uh, potential matter. Um, and so based on that, I uh, will be asking the court to uh, impose uh, a money bail um, on the defendant, as well as to set additional conditions. The defendant's current conditions are minimal to non uh, existent, which is appropriate when someone receives uh, an OR. But based on this new information, uh, the court uh, has a wide variety of uh, restrictions available to impose uh, on the uh, defendant. One of what, and I'm referring to um, section 11 of NRS 178.484. Uh, which allows the court to impose uh, any reasonable or reasonable conditions on the person as it deems necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare uh, of the community uh -huh. and to ensure uh, appearance. So uh, as we know, in the broad scheme of bail, uh, you're, this court is ought to be concerned with appearance and or risk to the community. Appearance is less of a concern to the state, but the risk to the community uh, warrant such restrictions. So in that vein, I, uh, when the court's ready, I would like to call Nicole Lubitsch. Could you indicate the last name a bit louder? Lubitsch, L-U-B-I, I think it's C-H. All right. So what we will do is we will hear witness testimony. Obviously, Mr. Bataro will be allowed to ask the witness questions. Um, Mr. Patar will also have the chance, obviously, to discuss and argue his uh, motion that he filed in opposition. So do we have Ms. Lubitsch present on the Zoom? Yes, Judge, she's connecting the audio right now. All right.
court has a few comments before we begin. We are on the record in the matter, case D-505. You guys either agree or I order. You're going to convince me to hold your client in contempt. Raise your right hands, face the court clerk to be sworn. I'm Judge Ryan Sullivan. Can you hear me? And would you unmute yourself at this time? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Yes, I can hear you. All right. I'm going to swear you in. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you promise the testimony you're about to provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Stegge. Uh, Ma'am, will you please state uh, your name and spell your last name? My name is Nicole Lubitsch. L U B as in boy I C H. And uh, from what county and state do you join us from this afternoon? I am with the Nevada Department of Public Safety Records Communication and Compliance Division in Carson City, Nevada. And what is uh, do you have hold a position in that office? I am the management analyst three over the Brady Point of Contact Firearms Program here at the department and division. And what does that mean to be the uh, Brady Point of Contact? Um, we conduct all, I'm sorry, we conduct all the fire and background checks for the state of Nevada for purchasing redemption or private party sales in the state of Nevada per federal law under the Brady Act. And uh, did you recently have occasion to process or be involved in a uh, transaction involving one Stuart Henty? Yes, sir. And uh, explain uh, your role in that and what happened. This case was brought to me by my administrator regarding a call she had received from Mr. Hanty as a upset customer because he had been put into a deny status. She asked me to call him back after I reviewed his case to discuss what was going on with his case and why he had been put into a deny status. And uh, what does that mean to be in a deny status? A deny status is you are federally prohibited from owning, possessing, or purchasing a firearm in the state of Nevada per federal law. Okay. And in this instance, the, um, your agency denied uh, the transfer uh, purchase or uh, other transaction. Is that right? That is correct, sir. On what basis did, or what was the underlying reason for that? The underlining, when we did our background check, the information that was provided was that he was federally denied under Title 18 USC 922N. And so you uh, then did call back uh, Mr. Henty, is that right? That is correct, sir. And uh, how did you know uh, what number to call and that you were, in fact, talking to Stu Henty? My administrator provided me with a phone number. Our practices is when we do contact the customers via phone, I have a protocol that I ask them um, to clarify information, I have to ask them a series of questions to identify whom I'm speaking to or else I'm unable to release the information that we're looking at. 
And that um, series of questions is, have you ever been arrested or in contact with law enforcement? If you have, when, where, and what was it for? So Mr. Hanty was able to identify what we were looking at in our case to where I was able to discuss the information that we were looking at at that time. Okay. And so during, the, and during this conversation, what was uh, with Mr. Hanty, what was discussed? Um, so in the beginning of the call, we discussed information about his case. He advised me that he had been arrested on August 14th of 20, 20, 2019 for two felony charges, one being kidnapping and one being conspiracy to kidnap. <clears throat> this was matching with what I was looking up for and where it was out of out of Reno. So I was able to discuss this information with him. He asked me, he advised that he was the, and sorry, I'm sorry. He asked why he was put into a deny status. And I advised him that per title 18 United States code 922 N that he was denied under that law, which is felony indictment and or information in our federal law. Um, during our conversation, he advised that one of the felonies had been dropped at the time and two other felony charges had been added, which I, that's not information that was pertinent to the information that he was providing. I advised that he had an open felony case because he continued to ask why he was denied. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he also advised me that I was imposing on his rights and that he had many guns in his house at this time. And I said, Think, okay. He said, you, are you going to send ATF after me? If you are, go ahead and send them. They will never find them. Um, I advised him that he was again uh, denied under Title 18 United States Code 922N. And he stated, well, I'll just have my wife go pick up the firearm. And I advised him that that is considered a straw purchase in the state of Nevada, and it is illegal. And he advised me, well, that the gun was partially hers. He continued to advise me that I can't do this to him and he knows the laws and is very familiar with them. I asked him if he would like me to send his letter to him again, as he had stated he had never received the original letter he requested from us through our appeal process as to why he was denied. And he stated yes. He then advised me that he was going to sue me and that I will receive contact from his attorney. I asked Mr. Hanty if he had any further questions or anything else he needed from me. He said no. I advised him to have a good day and he hung up on me. Uh, was that the last time you ever spoke with him? Yes, sir. What uh, was his demeanor like uh, throughout this uh, conversation? He seemed a little upset with me because we were imposing the deny on the firearms. Um, it, it's not uncommon, but to when he said that he had guns and was wondering if we were going to send ATF after him, he seemed a little upset and then very defending in the sense that he was going to hide his guns or they would never find him. Like, go ahead and come get them. You'll never find them. Um, I, he, he just seemed like he was agitated in the sense, but not super unpleasant with me. Okay. Um, and uh, he did make the statement that he would sue you um, for the action that the department took. Yes, sir. Uh, have you ever spoken with uh, Mr. Hanty's uh, counsel, Mr. Pataro? No, sir. Okay. And uh, when did this happen, this conversation and uh, denial? With Mr. Hanty? Yes. It was on February 19th in the morning of this year, 2021. Okay. And what was the um, gun store? Was there a gun store involved? In my conversation? No, just like the the thing, the purchase or transaction that was denied, what was that transaction? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Was What was Mr. Hanty trying to do uh, that the department denied? He was trying to purchase a firearm from a local gun shop in Reno, Nevada. And which uh, gun shop is that? Maccabee Arms. Are you familiar with Reno you know, Guns and Range? Yes, sir. Is, is, is that a separate gun store than the one you just mentioned? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'll pass the witness. All right. 
Mr. Fataro, do you have questions for Ms. Lubitsch? Um, you said that uh, you told Mr. Hanty that he was under indictment or information under federal law. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Are you familiar with 18 U.S. 922N? I'm not a lawyer. You don't have to be a lawyer. You're, you're supposed to be the person who is uh, uh, enforcing uh, uh, the Nevada laws. And the one you're talking was, was 922N, wasn't it? Yes, sir. 18 United States 922N. Now, 18 United States Code 922N said if a person is under indictment. And Your Honor, here I object. As I stated before, I'm not arguing whether he is or is not prohibited. I think he probably is. But that's a separate issue from his demeanor and his statements made to uh, the depart this witness. Well, I mean, we'll, we can we well. That's well, I, I believe Mr. Stegi says that that was discussed in in your questions from Ms. Lu, which I will allow Mr. Pataro to to address that either, knowing that that that's not ultimately the real issue here. So go ahead, Mr. Pataro. Well, uh, you had said he was, and you were aware of what he was charged with, correct? Yes, sir. And he was not charged under indictment, was he? Per protocol and our policies no, and procedures. Was he charged under an indictment? I can't answer that question. Well, you knew what he was charged with, didn't you? He had two open felony charges. He, he had criminal complaints him. pending in justice. Objection argumentative. Your Honor, if I may, this is actually the heart of it. What we have is a state law that quite truthfully, I, from a fair reading, it doesn't take a lawyer to be able to read 922N and understand that 922N does not prevent a person who has a criminal complaint pending in a justice court from owning a firearm. Now, and, and, and it, it's apparent, it, it, it's patently obvious, especially when you look at the history of 922N and, you know, quite true, there's someone who does extensive practice in federal court, uh, 18 United States 922 is one we deal with a lot. 922N was to prevent people who have already, who have had a probable cause finding uh, that in fact, a crime was committed. An indictment is the, the document that arises out of a probable cause finding uh, that a crime was committed and uh, the defendant uh, committed it. An information in Nevada follows the same uh, procedure and that is an information is filed only after a determination of probable cause is made that a person is in fact uh, 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 under a crime and, and or maybe the person. It does not prohibit under any way, shape, manner, and form, nor could it, the fact that a person being charged without any finding by a court uh, of probable cause. As the court is well aware, uh, a, a probable cause determination is required constitutionally, either by the justice court and state court or by an indictment in federal court or state court. So that's what we're talking about. And so when you have, with all due respect, uh, an individual cop knowing that you can see the plain language of it, and he is being told by someone that he is under indictment and information, when he tells the person, no, I'm not, and it's a criminal complaint in justice court, and that person insists he's a felon, and that that is what it is, and it doesn't matter, he's not getting his, his weapon, if that wouldn't aggravate anyone, I don't know what would. Secondly, when you deal with that, I would, I would be aggravated if told me it's like standing in front of the DMV and, and line A for two hours and telling me, look, you should have gone to line B first. Um, these things aggravate, especially when a person who is giving out information on behalf of the state that is incorrect. The statement she is ma uh, making to him or not. Your Honor, I wonder, if, I'm sorry to Mr. Pitar, if we could continue with the witness and do the argument later. Well, the, Your you're Honor. saying this is, I, this is the relevancy of what we are dealing with, Judge, and this is why it is. Well, it, so it's. Counsel, counsel, 
just just a moment, please. So, Mr. Bataro, you can ask this witness questions. I'll allow you to do that. This area was explored by Mr. Stegi. However, we are not here today litigating this particular issue. Now, the issue we're talking about is the motion regarding Mr. Hanty's conditions of release, his custody status. So we're not we're not litigating this this federal issue of gun ownership today. So I, I will certainly let you ask questions to, to point out what you indicated you're going to argue about the level of frustration experienced by Mr. Hanty. I hear you there, but let's not spend a, a whole lot of time on the issue that the court is not litigating today, Mr. Hanty's um, rights with the Department of Public Safety or, or those those matters. So go ahead, Mr. Pataro. All right. When you told Mr. Hand he was under indictment information, he told you that he wasn't, didn't he? I'm sorry? He told you that he wasn't under indictment of information, didn't he? Correct. And you told him he was. He said he was denied under Title 18 USC 922N per our research. Because he was under indictment or information. Because right. he had two open felony charges on his record. 922 doesn't talk about open felony charges, yes, does it? And, and, and again, Mr. Pataro, I, I will sustain the objection in that we're not, I, I don't want to have a whole lot of arguing with the witness about the state of this law. This, this law is not what we're litigating right now today. So certainly you can ask her questions about the encounter, about the demeanor, and I think you've made your record as to that your argument, I, I think you're, you're going to state, is that she was uh, incorrect in giving him this information on the phone. I, I hear that, but I, I don't want to have a whole lot of argument basically about who's right on that point of the, the law, because that's not what we're litigating today. And when Mr. Handy told you that about uh, having other uh, uh, guns, uh, he told you, for example, he had squirt guns, didn't he? No. And then he told you he had other type of guns, and you asked him if he was being sarcastic with you. No. And he told you, yeah, he was being sarcastic with you because you were wrong. No, you're no, sir. He told you you were wrong on the interpretation of what you were saying, didn't he? He told me I was incorrect on having him under felony indictment, but he did not tell me I was incorrect on anything regarding the firearms in his home. Okay. And he was upset that, that you would not uh, uh, agree with him, wasn't he? It seemed like it, yes. Okay. And what we can agree upon is that what he was upset about was the fact that he wasn't under indictment or information, correct? Like you told him he was. I can't say why he was upset, honestly. Well, he was upset with the conversation of you, with you. The conversation was that when you told him that he was under indictment or information. Just an act of speculation and asked an answer. Uh, I, again, and I, compound this. Mr. Mr. Pataro, I would just ask you to, to clarify a bit in, in your questions so the witness can answer them. Okay. Mr. Hanty was upset with you. Yes, sir. And he was upset with you based on what you were telling him. Yes, sir. And what you told him was, in essence, that he was under indictment and inform or information and therefore could not have the firearm. Objection compoundness. Overruled. I think that's a straightforward question. Will you repeat the question, sir? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, after after uh, uh, he, you said he was upset with you, and I said he was upset with you after you told him that he uh, was under indictment or information and therefore couldn't have the firearm, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and he explained to you numerous times, or he told you numerous times, you were wrong. Yes, sir. Right? And he told you that he was under criminal complaint, right? He just told me I was incorrect and he wasn't under felony indictment. Were you aware what the stat, what the nature of the charge against him was, the document? No, sir. 
Okay. Do you know the difference between a criminal complaint, an indictment, or an information? No, sir. Okay. Now, he, you also testified in direct examination that you said that Mr. Uh, Hanty was purchasing a firearm from a Maccabee firearm. Yes, sir. And Mr. Hanty told you that wasn't true, didn't he? Mr. Hanty said he was getting his gun back. Mr. Handy told you that he was received, that he had had his gun transferred uh, from out of state to Nevada and he was getting his own gun back, correct? Correct. But the documentation provided by the, the gun store was that he was purchasing a handgun. Where was, what did, what did Mr. Handy say in his documentation? It's the document, the federal 4473 form that's provided to us on a denied case. What did Mr. Handy write there? It's, I don't know if it's Mr. Hanty or the gun store that wrote it. Okay, so Mr. Handy told you that he wasn't purchasing the gun, didn't he? He said he was trying to get his gun back. Right. And are, are you aware of the way firearms have to be or can be transferred between states? Yes. Okay, that an individual can transfer uh, a firearm to another person in another state. Jackson, uh, same objection. Your Honor. What? We're, what we're successfully doing is, is litigating uh, the question of whether he can uh, own a firearm or transfer a firearm or whatever, and ignoring the statements that were made. And so uh, that's my objection. Well, no, with all due respect, Your Honor, this is the second thing that they raised is that he was purchasing the, the firearm and he was telling her, no, he wasn't. It was his own firearm. So I, I will allow Mr. Pataro to explore this, but again, Mr. Pataro, I would just ask that you keep in mind that the purpose of this hearing. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, he, he told you on numerous times during this conversation uh, that it was his own firearm, didn't he? Yes. And he was getting upset that you kept saying he was buying a firearm. I said he but, was denied from owning, possessing, or purchasing a firearm in the state of Nevada. Well, you told him that he was purchasing a firearm from Maccabee. Objection asked and answered. She just gave the answer. No, she didn't. Yes, I'll she allow did. it. You I'll don't like the answer, sir, but it doesn't mean you get to ask the question again once she says exactly what she told you. Mr. Stegi, I will allow the question. So I said he was denied from owning, possessing, or purchasing a firearm in the state of Nevada. Isn't it true you told him that he was purchasing the weapon. He was buying it from McAfee. No. You know, when Mr. Stegi asked you that question, you you said that you told him that he was purchasing it. This states the evidence. Okay. Didn't you say that? Objection misstates the evidence. So again, I, I, I okay. think Mr. Patara, you've made your record for the argument you want to lie. I, I think at this point we are getting off okay. off of what this purpose of the hearing really is. It's not about litigating Mr. Hanty's gun rights. That's not what this court is deciding today. So I'm, I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. Well, well, let's leave it at that. It was pretty clear that Mr. Hanty was very upset with the uh, answers that you were giving him to what he was telling you. Yes. And he was telling you that you were incorrect. Yes. Okay. And he told you that he wasn't purchasing a weapon or a firearm. It was his own firearm that was being transferred to him. Objection asked and answered. I'm just trying to end the objection. Times so we know right and Mr. Pataro, I, I believe we, that question has been asked and answered okay. several times, and she's indicated uh, an assertion to your question. Now, uh, you said Mr. Hanty uh, uh, said that he was uh, going to sue you. Yes. He didn't say he was going to hurt you, did he? No. He didn't say he was going to come down and punch you, did he? No. He said he was going to start a legal process against you. Correct. And the, he was going to start that legal process against you because what he felt was your misinterpretation of the law. Correct. And that you were, in fact, violating his Second Amendment. Correct? He felt that way, yes. Yes. And, and you will admit that people have the right to redress uh, grievances by going to court, right? They have, yep, they have those rights. Okay. So uh, what he said, he was gonna sue you and he was agitated during his conversation with you. Yes. 
Now, let me get to, uh, uh, being a person being agitated is not unusual, is it? Not in my line of work, no. Okay, I have nothing further. Mr. Stegi, any follow up questions for this? Question? Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Hanty was bragging about his knowledge of a lot. Did he ever use the term information? That he's not under an information as, as the, a word his lawyer just used. No. Did he ever use the term indictment during uh, his conversation with you? Yes, he said he wasn't under indictment. Okay, nothing further. All right, anything further based on that, Mr. Pacharo? No, Your Honor. All right, uh, counsel, may this witness be excused? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lubitsch. You may be excused. You can log thank off you. the hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Stegi, do you have other witnesses you'd like to call at this time? Uh, I believe I'll rely on the uh, testimony just given and the uh, exhibit attached to my uh, motion going forward. All right, so Mr. Stegi, would you like to continue arguing at this time? And I'll turn to Mr. Pataro for any witnesses and argument. Well, uh, I'd like, frankly, the court to turn to Mr. Pataro and yes, and I'm his, sorry, I misspoke. And his I, evidence, I, and then I get to argue. Yes, front and yes. back. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that. Yes. So, Mr. Pataro, uh, do you have any witnesses you would like to call related to this matter? Uh, I'd like to just quickly call Mr. Hanty. All right, Mr. Hanty, would you please raise your right hand? Do you promise the testimony about to provide today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do, Your Honor. And Your Honor, I'd just like to uh, uh, make the observation that the court acknowledged that a person who testifies in support of one constitutional right does not give up uh, another constitutional right uh, by so testifying. I'm sorry, Mr. what? Peggy, were you making a motion with your hand? Only to draw the court's attention. I didn't hear what Mr. Pataro just said. What, what I'm saying is, Your Honor, that, that and when I have a, a hearing pending in front of a court that affects a constitutional right, and that's right, the right to bail, uh, that the person can testify concerning that without that being uh, used as an admission in a court by itself, such as, as, as when one would testify at a, a suppression hearing, uh, his testimony at a suppression hearing cannot be used as uh, uh, evidence against them uh, without a, a foundation. It can be used if a person misstates something for, uh, uh, for impeachment purposes, but not as a uh, not as a direct evidence. I think that's pretty uh, a pretty pretty clear with most people who look at look at that stuff. If if uh, most of the time it comes up in terms of the suppression motion, where a person testifies in suppression motion. And the testimony he gives, he does not waive his right against self-incrimination by testifying at the suppression. This is likewise the same thing in a, uh, a bail hearing. Um, uh, so that's the, the point I'm making right at the beginning. Uh, I would agree that uh, Mr. Pitara is correct on, on suppression motions. I would need uh, to be convinced uh, for the general proposition that uh, waiving one right, uh, you know, testifying in the bail context uh, affords some sort of blanket protection for other uh, rights against self-incrimination. Did you hear that, Mr. Pataro? Yes. All right, would you still like to proceed with Mr. Hanty? Yes. All right, go well, ahead. I, I think Mr. Stegi is wrong. If you want me to comment on, on what it is, I think he's wrong. Okay. And Mr. Uh, Pataro, if I'm happy to, happy to be wrong and be convinced that I'm wrong all day. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, Mr. Hanty, are you there? I am, sir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I, and I want to keep this very narrow, Your Honor, so that we, we do limit it. Uh, Mr. Hagee uh, said that uh, uh, you were a violent person because you kicked a garbage can. Uh, and I want to ask you, did you kick a garbage can? I kicked a garbage can on December 24th, 2001, when I was relieved of duty. 2001? Correct, sir. 20 years ago? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, secondly, did you have a conversation with this uh, Ms. Uh, Nichols, was her name? Nicole, correct. Nicole, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't, was that her last name or her first name? Uh, Nicole Lubish, if the memory serves me correct here. Okay. 
Did you have a conversation with her? I did. And uh, would you, uh, uh, did you have a conversation where she was telling you facts that you did not believe were true? Correct. And could you tell the court what that, the nature of that conversation was concerning those facts? She was referring to the federal law, uh, which prohibits people under felony indictment information to uh, own, possess, or carry a firearm in the state of Nevada. I disagreed with her because I said I was not under any of those circumstances. I was under a criminal complaint. And that began the whole downward slide of that conversation. Okay. And what did she say in response to you telling her that? That she was going to stand by her decision to uh, basically keep my own personal firearm which I have owned for 18 years since I purchased it in 2002 from the gun trader on 467 East Plum Lane here in Reno, that she was going to keep uh, that firearm from being denied, being given back to me after I loaned the firearm to a friend who had subsequently traveled out of state. Right, when she told you that, uh, when she told you that you were under the indictment information, you, you said you told her she wasn't, and you, and you explained to her where you were in the criminal justice system, correct? Correct. We, uh, you heard her testify that you told her that you had one case uh, uh, dismissed in justice court or, and then another one. I yeah. told her that I had two initial charges filed against me by the district attorney's office, that one of them had been dropped prior to the first preliminary hearing motion, and that two additional charges were then filed against me at the first preliminary hearing motion. Can you explain that to her? Yes, yes sir, I did. And, and did that have any effect upon her? No, sir, it did not. All right, and you, you heard it testify that uh, you said you were going to sue her? Correct. All right, uh, and you've been contemplating that? If I had been denied my Second Amendment rights, yes, and I did state that to her. I was intending to file a, a civil lawsuit. Okay, uh, one last uh, uh, thing on it, and that had to do with, you mentioned that you had other guns? Correct. Okay, did, uh, did you tell her that you felt that you owned all, any firearm you had, you always owned it legally? Correct, the last firearm that I purchased was in 2014 and it was a long gun. I have never attempted to purchase any other firearms and you can check the records through any gun owner here in the state of Nevada. I've owned that specific firearm since 2002. I've had other firearms and to readdress the situation involving her, I asked her if I could transfer the firearm ownership over to my wife. It wasn't a threat, it was a statement. And she said, no, response. that was an illegal straw purchase and that I couldn't do that. And I said, ma'am, I'm not purchasing the gun. I own the gun. And it continued downhill from there. Uh, um, and once, ag once again, so uh, but you made no threat against her. Jackson leading the witness. Can you just rephrase your question, Mr. Pataro? All right. Uh, did you make any declarations to her of what you were going to do based upon her actions? I did. I said I was going to file a Second Amendment civil lawsuit against her for violation of my Second Amendment rights. I never threatened any violence against her or anybody else. And uh, let me ask you this. You, when you first found out that the firearm was not going to be uh, returned to you. And I don't mean by the state. Uh, how many attempts did you make to contact the Department of Public Service Brady Division to, to talk to someone? When I was made mention or made known of the fact that uh, my firearm was not going to be returned to me, I made at least 15 to 20 attempts to contact the Department of Public Safety Brady Compliance Division. What had happened was they had a voicemail set up where you could leave a message. However, at the end of the voicemail, uh, I was uh, basically the voicemail hung up on me. And I actually reached out to a friend of mine who I worked with at Nevada Highway Patrol, to Lieutenant Luis Ayala Zapata, and asked him if there was any way I could make contact with an actual person or leave a message on a voicemail. He gave me a subsequent number. I tried that number. And in actuality, that number sent me back for the first one. So finally, what I decided to do was make a direct call to Director of Department of Public Safety, George Tagliati's office. I spoke to his secretary. I said, this is a matter of urgency for me because I would like to retrieve my own personal firearm back. 
she put me in contact with the uh, young lady, Nicole. I left a message. She subsequently called me. Now that, that started on February 17th. She called me back on February 18th, left a voice message. And then we actually connected via telephone on February 19th of 2021. I have nothing further. Mr. Stegi. Thank you. Uh, what did you say when you kicked that garbage can at, uh, when being fired from NHP? Well, sir, I'd like to correct you. I was never fired from NHP. I retired with good standing in 2003. So that's an incorrect statement. I said, I feel like killing um, like you would say when your children act up and misbehave. Isn't it true that in, uh, you were, the, well, a after um, you were let go or were going to be fired after a number of missteps at NHP, is that true? Objection, assuming facts not in evidence and irrelevant. Uh, this is a bail area, so what is constant. He was one that threw in uh, uh, the idea of a garbage can uh, and without letting the court know that that incident was 20 years uh, before. So I think this is uh, irrelevant to the motion uh, at hand. The man's character is at issue. He claims to be an expert uh, in the law or to know uh, the law. And the, the thrust of the motion was that he made uh, threats to kill his supervisors. No, the, with all the respect, the thrust of the motion, the, the, the state has argued we can't get into the legality of what it was. He actually is saying that he uh, was correct on the uh, uh, 922N. I, I cited that to the court, showed court the court 922N, and I showed the court the uh, pay sheet that the Department of Public Service sends out that has nothing to do with a criminal complaint. And, and so, I mean, that is the thing. And this concept of character, uh, Valdez uh, uh, Garcia, I mean, it says quite true, the issue of bail is, is he gonna show up and or is he a danger? And this idea that Mr. Stege or, or people involved in this prosecution don't like his character because he's outspoken is, is not an issue for this court uh, uh, to uh, be determining. And, uh, so, Mr. Bataro, the, the issue was raised regarding the garbage can. You, you, you asked Mr. Handy about that. I will allow Mr. Stege to ask some follow-up questions re related to that. Go ahead, Mr. Stege. And, and so, Mr. Handy, uh, the, the statement, isn't it true, that you made upon being relieved is that uh, you feel like, I won't curse, but I feel like effing killing them. Isn't that true? No, it's incorrect, Mr. Stagey. I just stated to you the statement. Actually, I feel like fucking killing um, and I apologize, Your Honor, for that. Uh, after I kicked the garbage can. Okay. Uh, I was relieved of duty. In fact, uh, if you want to go directly to the question, Mr. Kirkland was contacted. The Reno Police Department were dispatched, and they never took a report because it, it was not a direct threat. I've never made any threat to kill anybody. Period. And sir, you've been in court before, right? Hundreds of times. Right. And you've been uh, deposed been in numerous depositions, right? Um, I've been, well, I've testified. I don't know about specifically depositions. That's a different avenue that I would look at versus testimony in court. But okay. But, but you do understand how it works, right? Like the attorney asks the question, you uh, give the answer to the question, not to whatever you want to say, right? I've, I've always stated if you ask the question, I answer the question the way I feel it should be appropriately answered. Sometimes it agrees with the attorney and sometimes it doesn't. And unless the judge interjects or objects, then I'm allowed to continue answering the question in the manner I'm allowed to. Okay. Th that's your experience that you just get to keep talking until the judge tells you to stop talking. If you don't uh, I, 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 would, I don't think this is relevant. And as I give it back and forth, <laughs> I agree, Mr. Say. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think this is relevant to the issue today that we're okay. we're discussing. Okay, so it is true then that the statement you made was, "I just feel like fucking killing them." Um, sir, not them. Um, right. Um. Okay. <laughs> killing. Um. What does um mean, sir? In that context, it was a statement made when. Like, as I stated previously, when, like, for instance, a child acts out of control 
and you make this a statement in kind of like an exasperation mode, like just be like killing them. Okay. And I've heard that many times in my life because my parents have said it in front of me when I've acted up. Thank you. Okay. And, and so it, it was about the same feeling when you got told you weren't uh, going to work at NHP was the same feeling you would have about a child acting up. Well, sir, again, an incorrect statement on your part. I was relieved of duty. I was not terminated. And I also stated previously in this, this testimony here that I retired from the state of Nevada as a, straight, as a senior state trooper in April of 2003 with a good standing status. In fact, I have an ID card to prove that. So I was not terminated or fired on December 24th. I was relieved of duty. I was able to get my job back. And subsequent to that, I was placed on administrative leave with pay. And on April 8th, 2003, I respectfully and with dignity retired from the state of Nevada. And subsequently sued the department. Correct. And subsequently I deposed. The of that. And I, I agree. I, I don't see the relevance of this, this particular line of questioning to the issue at hand. Okay. Uh, sir, isn't it true there were five internal affairs complaints pending against you upon uh, your uh, uh, leaving? Your Honor, this is not, it's not relevant. Uh, this is relevant to a bail uh, and not things that go back and were never pled. Well, the, the uh, man asserts good standing upon leaving uh, NHP. Uh, I'm inquired to, or allowed to traverse that. So I, I, I will allow some questions regarding this given given the assertion. So go ahead, Mr. Stegi. Can you rephrase a question, Mr. Stegi? The number was five of internal affairs complaints pending against you at the time you departed NHP. Isn't that true? Actually incorrect, sir. Uh, there were five internal complaints filed against me. However, they asked me to sign a statement that would basically resolve them of any type of further action, and we both agreed to that. To this day, I don't know where that document is, but uh, again, I was put back in an active duty status. Would have been late 2002. Okay, and, sir, and, what was the question? The question was that you had five pending, and my, right. my statement to you is incorrect. Okay. It was not pending. They were already resolved. Were you previously asked the following question? Do you know how many internal affairs investigations were pending? when you left the highway patrol? And your, to your answer, I believe five. And I say five, but not pending, they were resolved. Okay, so your answer to how many pending was, I believe five was, you didn't really mean you believe five. Five yeah. and were resolved. Okay. Um, You, so you admit making this, uh, the statement to Ms. Lubitsch that uh, questioning whether the ATF was going to be sent to your house? I inquired. I don't know the exact uh, parameters of it. I think I tied in the ATF with the fact that I owned other firearms. And were, right. were they going to come to the house and take those as well? And you also admit to making the statement that uh, the ATF would never find any weapons if they were to go to your house. Isn't that true? No. Incorrect. And um, you admit making the statement that you would just have your wife uh, do the transfer if um, you were denied. Partially correct. I asked her if I could have my wife do the transfer to her for and, the weapon. Yet Miss Lubitsch says that's not what you said. She says that you uh, said you would just have your wife do it if you were denied. And she's incorrect. Okay, so then she's also incorrect when she says that you stated that ATF would never find your guns. No, I did not say that. Okay, so she's incorrect there too. Correct as well. Okay. Um, this isn't the first time you tried to transfer that firearm, is it? Actually, you are correct. It is not the first time I tried to retrieve a firearm. The first time was at Reno Guns and Range. Right, and so you um, you stated that you told Nicole, hey, this is the gun I've owned forever and this big long narrative about it. But that's not what you told her. You, you said, I need this transfer to go through, right? Specifically? No, I did not say that to her, sir. Okay, well, 
Did you tell her about uh, the history you relayed on direct examination? Did you relay that history to Miss Lubitsch about how it was out of state with your friend and all this stuff? Well, there was a discussion, Mr. Stagey, about the actual selling and possessing of this firearm. And I did state to her that I had owned the firearm since 2002 and, I, and had been sent from out of state to Reno Guns and Range. Reno Guns and Range, I filled out the Brady paperwork and they came back and said, we don't feel comfortable in allowing you this firearm to be released to you. But if you would like to, we would send it to another firearm dealer in town. And that's what and I said. I said it to Maccabee Firearms. That's and when I filled out the Brady paperwork the second time, if you let me continue, sir. And that's when the state came back and actually denied me. So the process that initiated at Reno Guns and Reins was never properly delineated with, okay. with the Brady Compliance Division. I'm ready for my, sir. So uh, what was the difference in time between the Reno Guns and Range incident and going to Maccabee? Reno um, Guns and Range incident took place the week before Christmas of 2020. And uh, I immediately called the owner of Maccabee Arms once I left. The gun was subsequently transferred over, I believe, in the next couple of days. So it would have been right around the Christmas time of 2020. And then uh, I went down to Maccabee Arms to fill out the paperwork again. And the gun uh, was in the possession of Maccabee Firearms, where, in fact, it is still today. And then I received a phone call from Mr. Sharon Orn, who owns Maccabee Firearms. He said, the state has denied you getting your firearm back. You need to come down and pick up the paperwork, which I did. That would have been right around after Christmas, between Christmas 2020 and the beginning of this new year. Right. So, but in reality, we're talking about, okay, about two months between uh, the first gun shop and what we're talking about with Miss Lubitsch. Isn't that true? Correct. Okay. And uh, the, you have uh, read the report of Detective Lopez about your conversation with Mark Covington at Reno Guns and Range, haven't you? Yes, I have read it. And is it true that you made the statements that uh, Jason Soto was going to pay for what he did to you? Incorrect. Isn't it true you made the statement that Chris Hicks, District Attorney of Washoe County, was going to pay uh, for what he did to you? Incorrect. Uh, and that uh, me, a mistake, was going to pay for uh, the prosecution of you. Incorrect. 